Only within a century after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Islam spread from Arabia, across Mesopotamia, to as far west as Spain, and east to the borders of China. Islam unified people from different cultures, languages, and traditions, not just by one faith, but also through a pursuit of knowledge. Islam is not just about spirituality, but Islam is a complete way of life, bound by ethics and ideals encompassing all aspects of life. In the medieval ages, at a time when Europe was in the core of darkness, it was the Muslims who picked up the torch of scholarship and made incredible scientific advances in almost every sector of knowledge. This period, from 7th to 15th centuries, became known as the Golden Age of Islam. True geniuses in Baghdad, Cairo, Damascus, and Cordoba, such as Ibn Sina, Al-Khwarizmi, and Ibn Haytham, among many other Muslim scholars, took on knowledge of ancient times from Egypt, Mesopotamia, Persia, Greece, India, and China, and expanded, made discoveries, and developed it to what we call modern science. Advances were made in medicine, mathematics, engineering, astronomy, chemistry, philosophy, art, and architecture, etc. Arabic texts replaced Greek as the fonts of wisdom, helping to shape the scientific revolution of the Renaissance and eventually the entire Western world. Today, terms such as algebra, algorithm, alcohol, abacus are so commonly used, but their origins have been largely forgotten, as with many other contributions of the Islamic empire. Over the centuries, colonialism, the organization of Western educational model, along with Eurocentrism, often portrays Islam as backwards, irreconcilable with science and technology, and sometimes even anti-educational. An evident cultural dichotomy can be observed between traditional Islamic education, restricted to religious groups, and secular Western education in mainstream schools, colleges, and universities. While, if not for the legacy of Muslim scholars, the Western world might have looked very different from what it is today. The two major periods of intense scholarly work in the Muslim world was in the 9th and 10th centuries in Baghdad, and in the 12th and 13th century in Europe, primarily Spain. These were the major centers of learning. The Islamic empire had a very high literacy rate, Children would be sent to school not only to study Islam, but learn science, philosophy, mathematics, art, and many other subjects. This process of education was later formalized by schools known as madrasas. Madrasas were mosques as well as boarding houses and libraries in a single compound. Some of these madrasas became the world's first universities. The Muslims placed a lot of value on education and scientific discovery, regardless of the information's origins, studying the works of non-Muslims to advance their body of knowledge. Muslim scholars spanning over the entire empire started what is called the translation movement and translated the works of Greeks, Persians, Indians, and various other ancient knowledge. These works were then assimilated, disseminated, tested, analyzed, and innovated upon with important and original contributions to the knowledge which was otherwise in cases flawed. Modern science today works with theories and models that must be tested empirically. And the Muslims did just exactly that, developing the procedures for testing and experimenting knowledge both empirically and logically. The process of translation reached its peak with the establishment of the House of Wisdom, Bayt al-Hikmah, by the Abbasid Caliph al-Mamun in Baghdad in 830. These ideas and procedures of Muslim scholars then became available to Western Europe. Far before the times of Galileo, Descartes, and Newton, the contributions of early Muslim scholars are so many. To share them in just one episode is impossible. So here is a brief analysis of a few Muslim scholars and their incredible works. Before the Islamic era, medical care in medieval Europe was largely provided by priests, 
who place emphasis on the soul rather than the medical treatment of the body. Ill patients were taken to hospitals of the medieval age to either live or die by God's will. Sickness was seen as a sign of immorality, punishment from God, or as a condition caused by supernatural forces which might take the form of diabolical possession. At a time like this, a significant Arabic medical book was translated to Latin and reached Europe. The Canon of Medicine by Ibn Sina, or Avicenna as known in the West. The Canon of Medicine contained Greek medical knowledge together with Arabic interpretations and contributions. Ibn Sina created a system of medicine that today we would call holistic and in which physical and psychological factors, drugs, and diet were combined in treating patients. Muslim physicians learned how to use sedatives, pioneered the use of antiseptics to clean wounds, and also used sutures made from gut and silk to bind wounds. Ibn Sina's book was the first authority on medical matters in Europe for several centuries. Ibn Sina also made advances in philosophy, geometry, astronomy, theology, and art. In the 10th and 11th centuries in Andalusia, Spain, Abul Qasim al Zahrawi, known in Europe as Abul Qasis, wrote the Kitab al Tasrif, Book of Concessions, a medical almanac which was translated in Latin and used by Muslims and in European medical schools for centuries. Al Zahrawi was a noted pathologist, describing hydrocephalus and other congenital diseases. He designed many of our modern surgical instruments that are still used today, such as scalpels, bone saws, forceps, and fine scissors for eye surgery. He established the cat gut, used for internal stitches, which dissolves away naturally and determined it can be used to encase capsules of medicine. Muhammad ibn Zakaria al-Razi, known in Latin as Razas, is considered today the father of psychology and psychotherapy. Al-Razi's studies included ideas involving human behavior, thus removing the theories of demons and witchcraft associated with the diseases in the Christian world. One of Al-Razi's books that spread through Europe was the treatise on smallpox and measles. He established separate wards in hospitals for the mentally ill, thereby creating the means for clinical observations of these diseases. Razi is also considered as the father of pediatrics due to his acknowledgement that children need to be treated differently to adults. Around the year 800, alchemy was converted into chemistry by Islam's foremost scientist, Jabir ibn Hayyan, known as Geber in Latin. He invented many of the basic procedures and equipments still in use today, like distillation, evaporation, crystallization, purification, filtration, and oxidization. He discovered sulfuric and nitric acid. He invented the alembic still for the creation of perfumes and alcoholic spirits. Ibn Hayyan was the founder of modern chemistry and the forerunner of the scientific method. The mathematical sciences as practiced in the Islamic world during this period consisted of algebra, geometry, as well as mathematical geography, astronomy, and optics. Muslims derived their theory of numbers in arithmetic from translations of Greek sources from Euclid's elements. They acquired numerals from India and possibly China and made their use widespread. Muslims built mathematical models using the decimal system, expressing all numbers by means of ten symbols, and each symbol accorded the value of position as well as absolute value. Muhammad bin Musa al-Khwarizmi designed the subject of algebra. The words such as algebra and algorithm are derived from him. His book on algebra, Hisab al-Jabr wal Muqabala, the calculation of integration and equation, was used until the 16th century as the principal textbook of European universities. In it, he composes that given an equation, collecting the unknowns in one side of the equation is called al jabr and collecting the known on the other side of the equation is called al muqabala
Other scholars, such as Thabit ibn Qura, known as the father of statistics, not only translated Greek words, but also argued against and elaborated on the widely accepted views of Aristotle. Umar Khayyam and Nasir al-Din al-Dusi contributed the concepts of irrational numbers, which did not have its origin in Greek mathematics. Muhammad bin Ahmed invented the concept of zero, or sifr, thus replacing the cumbersome Roman numerals. This was groundbreaking and led to advances in prediction of the movement of the planets and advances in the field of astronomy and geography. Sir Isaac Newton Sir Isaac Newton? It is well known that he came up with the laws of motion published in his book Principia. But what if these laws already existed? Whether Sir Isaac Newton collected these laws from elsewhere is a topic of debate. However, what is not are the manuscripts of some Muslim scholars in which these laws are present nearly seven centuries prior to Newton. The First Law of Motion In Ibn Sina's book, Insinuations and Notices, he identified the same law in his own words. You know, if the object is left unaffected by external influence, it remains as is. Second Law of Motion Earlier than Newton, in the book The Considered in Wisdom by Hibatullah ibn Malika al-Baghdadi, indicated in chapter 14 entitled The Vacuum, the faster the speed, the stronger the power. The stronger the power that pushes the object, the faster the speed of the object at move, and the shorter the time spent for covering the distance. Hibatullah bin Malika also stated, in the Considered in Wisdom, in the wrestling arena, everyone has a force practiced against the other. If one of them retreated, this does not mean that his power disappears, but this retreated power still exists because without it, the second one would not need it to influence the first one. The same concept has also been asserted by Ibn al-Haytham. The moving object is encountered by an obstruction, and if this force remains, this moving object retreats in the opposite direction in the same speed practiced by the first object and according to the power of obstruction. Though these laws may have existed prior to Newton, it was only through him that they were formulated into mathematics and became widely known. Abu Ali al-Hasan ibn al-Haytham, or in Latin al-Hazan, was one of the most renowned physicists and mathematicians. He was the first to describe accurately the various parts of the eye and give a scientific explanation of the process of vision. Ibn al-Haytham's theory of light and vision is neither identical nor directly descendant from any one of the theories known to have previously existed before Islam. Ibn Haytham is credited to have made the first magnifying glass. It wasn't until the 13th century that spectacles were invented, representing the first practical use of magnification in society. Ibn Haytham also made thorough examinations of the passage of light, and discovered the laws of refraction. He also carried out the first experiments of the dispersion of light in its constituent colors. He built the first camera obscura or pinhole camera, significant in the history of optics, photography, and the history of art. The Muslim world also made significant contributions to the field of astronomy, such as developing and improving astronomical instruments and building observatories. They were first established in the major cities such as Baghdad, Hamadan, Toledo. The Muslim invention of the astrolabe used to make astronomical measurements, typically of the altitudes of celestial bodies and in navigation of collecting latitude, was one of the most important in astronomy until the invention of, of the telescope in the 17th century. Ibn Hazm was an Andalusian Muslim polymath, historian, jurist, philosopher, and astronomer. By the 9th century, many Muslim scholars took for granted that the earth was a sphere. In fact, it's dated in the Quran. That's 500 years before the realization dawned on Galileo. The proof by astronomer Ibn Hazm is that the sun is always vertical to a particular spot on earth. In 1166, Muhammad al-Idrisi, the well-known Muslim scholar who served in the Sicilian court, 
produced very accurate maps, including the world map, with all the continents and their mountains, rivers, and famous cities. This map was created centuries before Marco Polo or Columbus explored the world, and is one of the most advanced ancient world maps. Muslim astronomers also almost accurately measured the Earth's circumference at 40,253.4 kilometers, less than 200 kilometers out. Some other renowned scholars were Ibn al-Nafis, father of circulatory physiology and anatomy, who discovered pulmonary circulation far before William Harvey, to whom it is credited. Abbas ibn Firnas, father of medieval aviation, who designed the first winged machine, which made a successful flight for a few minutes. It is thought his design influenced Leonardo da Vinci. Ismail al Jazari, father of robotics, who invented many mechanical devices, the most famous of which is the crankshaft. His contributions led to the creation of the steam engine, internal combustion engine, various automatic control devices, and other modern technology. The list of great Muslim scholars in the Islamic Golden Age and their incredible discoveries could go on and on. And it is impossible to mention the numerous Islamic scholars and their infinite contributions to science and technology. Sadly, this great Islamic empire would see its decline as new powers arose. First the Mongols, who in 1258 devastated Baghdad, burning down the House of Wisdom, and the many, many works of scholars which, if we had today, perhaps science would be at another level. In addition, other invading forces and colonial powers played a role in the decline of the Islamic Golden Age, such as the 11th century Crusades and the 15th century Reconquista, the aftermath of which is truly unfortunate, as many more valuable works were destroyed. Consequently, the flow of technology and ideas from the Islamic world to the West slowed down, and in the past 600 years has reversed. However, though largely overlooked, the legacy of the Islamic Empire remains with us in making possible Europe's own scientific and cultural renaissance. Like, share, and subscribe to create awareness. We are also available on Facebook, Twitter, and PalTalk.